So, um, hi everybody, great to see you all. Um, I'm Francesca Royster, I'm a professor in the department, and what do I do? Um, this quarter I'm teaching a class on uh, Toni Morrison, a graduate class, and a um, undergraduate class on graphic novels and social justice, and I kind of teach all around the curriculum, a little bit of Shakespeare, a little bit of African-American lit. Um, every once in a while I get to teach creative writing. I'm excited to teach a music writing class in the fall. And this is my 21st year here, I think. So um, that's me. <laughs> yes. Oh, yay, here comes Michaela. Great, 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 great. Um, so um, I am excited to get us started um, hearing from these lovely papers by Eric and Susanna and Michaela. So as soon as it looks like everything's rigged up, which I think it looks like it will be, we will get started just like in a, I'll give her another moment or two. All right, let's do it. Okay. <laughs> Hi. Um, okay, so this panel is called Redefining Myth and Tradition. And our panelists are Susana Cardenas Soto, uh, Eric Kanan, and Michaela Lawson. And we have a wonderful mix of literary study, uh, non creative nonfiction, and fiction. Uh, so it's going to be a real treat. Um, I'm going to introduce everybody, and then uh, maybe we can, uh, if just going alphabetically makes sense to, oh wait, well, what do you think? Want to do Susana, Eric, and Michaela as our order? Does that sound okay? Just to not be confusing? All right, so we'll do that. So they'll share um, five minutes from their, their work, and then we will have a great discussion. Okay, until 3.45. All right, so here, here's our bios. Um, and also just wave if there's something technically that I'm doing wrong, <laughs> because I'll just keep talking. Okay, um, Susana Cardenas Soto is a Cuban-American, Mexican-American writer and performance poet from Oak Park, Illinois, and soon to be graduate from DePaul University, class of 2020 with a Bachelor of Arts with a major in English and a minor in psychology. Susana's interdisciplinary work explores personal, historical, and literary theories of trauma through poetry, short form prose, memoir essays, literary criticism, and contemporary media studies. Currently, Susana is the resident writer for the Girl Scouts of Greater Chicago, yeah, and Northwest Indiana's marketing team. That's what, oh, Chicago and Illinois and Northwest Indiana. That's where you Okay. Um, Eric Kanan is graduating from the MAWP program at the end of this quarter. He has spent the last two years focusing on nonfiction storytelling, and he hopes to find work in science communication once he finishes up at DePaul. And Michaela Lawson is a 21-year-old English major with a focus in creative writing. She's been working as a barista for almost two years and loves coffee almost as much as she loves to write. Same here, Michaela, absolutely. Um, okay, so we're gonna start with Susana. Does that sound good? Okay, all right. Absolutely, hello everybody. So my work that I'm presenting and talking about today really focuses on John Milton, in particular, his first work, which is Comus um, or a Mask. That's what it's called. And I was really inspired while I was taking a class specifically on Milton. Um, and I, what I was struck by most when first reading Paradise Lost was in his first invocation to the Christian muse or the Holy Spirit. Um, he, he says his chief intention essentially in his writing in this particular artistic endeavor is to soar above the Aeonian Mount, which is a really interesting thing to think about when thinking about Milton. Um, 
basically to try to create a Christian mythos superior to the centuries of Greco-Roman lore, which is quite a task. Whether or not he achieved that I, in Paradise Lost is a completely different issue, but what I'm thinking about is his more unpracticed attempt at, at mythos. And this comes in the story of Comus, or a mask presented at Ludlow Castle, which was the play um, centering around a young lady, a virgin, who is separated from her two brothers in a dark wood. In this dark wood, a demon named Comus lives. And this demon is the son of the goddess Circe and the god Bacchus or Dionysus, who is the god of wine, of revelry, and of riot. And what I find so interesting about the choice of Milton to use those two in particular, what I, what I really focused on in my work was, you know, the demon, is, the demon is the combination of two of the most notoriously evil people, gods, in, in, in Greco-Roman lore written by written about by Ovid and Homer and countless others as being real sources of torment for the heroes. What is so crazy to me about how the story ends is that what saves this virgin, this virgin lady, what saves her chastity is not, you know, the angel Gabriel ascending from heaven. It's a Welsh river nymph who was the, the was revered uh, you know by written by Milton is revered by farmers so a pastoral river nymph that's pretty witchy so I, I what I really wrote about was like you know whether Milton whether or not Milton soared above the Aeonian Mount is one thing but what what is really important about his work I think is how long he stayed on that mount and how much he relied on it, even though he seemed to ideologically hate it. Um, and that's kind of, in a nutshell, what I wrote about. Was that five minutes? <laughs> you were um, just like, a, you could even talk a little bit more if you want, but you're great, you're right on, on time. Perfect. Um, Susanna, do you want to, um, well, first, let's, let's clap for you. <laughs> Thank you. Um, I should have talked about this with all the panelists, but would it be good to save all of our questions until after everyone has a chance to, to speak? Yeah, that sounds great. Okay. Thank you for that. That's amazing and rich. Okay. Um, all right, then why don't we move on to Eric? Thank you, Eric. Right. Yeah. So I'm just going to, I wrote a little introduction and then I'll read the last few pages of the, the long grass essay that I wrote. Um, all right. So I wrote the piece based on research I did into Kaselid, a shaman from the native people on Vancouver Island who is referenced fairly commonly in psychology and healthcare. Uh, he's usually portrayed as a skeptical native who doubted that the shamans within his tribe could really heal people, but he learned the shaman's ways himself, and even though he was intentionally tricking the people he healed, or pretending to be a shaman, as he put it, um, Caselid found that his patients recovered. Uh, in fact, this experience is actually, so the, the general story in healthcare, that's like the whole story. Um, but in the, the bigger truth that I kind of discovered through academic papers and things, is that this experience is is actually a small part of the complicated life story of George Hunt, a man with English and Klingit heritage. Uh, he was a shaman for the Nakwakstoks and Quagulth, who went on to become a major collaborator, informer, and collector for in influential anthropologist Franz Boas. I've presented the stories of Hunt and Caselet as a braided narrative that highlights and questions the work that Hunt and Boas did around the turn of the 20th century. So then going into the last couple pages here. Caselet's success in his first healing sparked something within him. He continued healing. He continued traveling the island. Caselid wanted to know if all shamans were pretending to be shamans like he was, like his teachers had been. He made a habit of visiting other shamans, of testing them. Only the Nakwakstok shamans used eagle down to make the sickness they had sucked out visible. Other shamans would suck out sicknesses, but they would get rid of it quickly or keep it out of sight. Often the solution worked well enough, but Caselid found that his display was especially powerful. 
Caselid would watch, a roll of eagle down tucked behind his lip while another shaman performed a healing. Then Caselid would get up and perform his own healing. His was always better, so shamefully better. He always had the proof of what the first shaman had left behind. No one was used to seeing that black, bloody sickness there tangibly on Caselid's palm. Something about seeing it helped sick people recover, gave their bodies permission to heal. Perhaps being an outsider, he carried some special mystique, some sense of exotic authority. Perhaps people dreamed of being healed by the Klingit shaman from across the island, or the white shaman. One night, only hours after Caselid had humiliated an old, famous, quaggled shaman, Caselid was led out to a white spruce tree far from Port Rupert. There sat the old shaman, reeling from the catastrophic healing. The old shaman would die of shame, he said. He was a plaything for his people now, he said. He confessed all his secrets to Caselid. His powers depended on secret nails, on balanced rattles, on bits of hidden tallow. What did Caselid's powers depend on? Were they real, or was he pretending? Pity me, friend, he said. In return, Caselid was silent. The sun was rising. He wanted to get home before anyone saw them. The old shaman disappeared from Fort Rupert for a year. He, his wife, and his daughter roamed the region, walking, begging, pleading for mercy. The old shaman came home mad, raving nonsense. Three years later, he died. Caselid spent less time healing, less time testing shamans, and more time guiding and interpreting for the white man who came to visit Fort Rupert. He had so much in common with them. In 1888, he met Franz Boas. George Hunt had access to secrets. Boas paid for those too, as long as they were written in Kwakwala. Hunt knew the stories of the chiefs from his youth. He knew the tricks of the shamans from his teens. He learned much more from his wives. Quaglets passed the secret ritual histories of their high-ranking families down through their women. Stories and secrets, individual, contradictory, unique to each family. They were said to be stored in a treasure box that each woman kept. Those on the outside who didn't have access to those secret histories were Witsatla. You cannot reach into that box of treasures. Hunt was convincing. He reached in and he passed the secrets out. His first wife was a chief's daughter and she kept him supplied with a steady stream of stories to send back to Boas. When she died of an illness, Hunt went silent. Boas pressed for more. Years later, Hunt remarried, again to a chief's daughter and again he started recording her secret stories. Some she didn't want to share. Some songs and prayers were between her, the spirits, and her descendants. Hunt would listen as she slept. He'd scribble down bits of prayers and lines of secret songs that she sang in her dreams and he'd sell them to Boas. Hunt was responsible for writing or supplying more than two thirds of all the information Boas published on natives who spoke Kwakwala in the early 20th century. Hunt and Boas called them the Kwakutl, erasing 17 distinct bands with one invented term. Of all the region's artifacts that ended up in museums around the world, Hunt collected and shipped nearly 80% of them. It was all filtered through him, explained by him, controlled by him. The story of Case Lit has lived on in the anthropological literature as the story of a skeptical, isolated shaman who found power in the symbolic rituals of his native people. The story has been passed from anthropologist to anthropologist, from scholars to storytellers, simplifying and warping. Hunt waited for the death of the Nakwaxtok shamans who had trained him before he told Boas about his experiences as Case Lit. Even then, he asked Boas to obscure this connection to the written shaman so that both he and Boas could die before anyone knew who Case Lit truly was. Boas and Hunt's professional correspondence, hundreds of letters sent over decades, is stored today in the American Philosophical Society in Philadelphia. Hunt's collected history, when looked at from a distance, creates a perfect illusion of the truth, as if there was a single truth to know about a million individual histories woven together, as if a people could be known by artifacts and stories displayed out of context, categorized and preserved, made tangible and easy to see. Was Caselet surprised to learn that his healings worked? Would George Hunt be surprised to learn that it's his records, his version of texts, histories, and myths that have given his people a cultural bedrock to grow from, that his, that his descendants are pillars of their culture today? Would he be surprised to learn that his name is reviled and praised, depicted as both a destroyer and a healer, depending on who's speaking? Could he say who is right, who is wrong? Could he pick out the best version of his own story? Would George Hunt know, would Caselid know, that the truth of his history is as unknown and unknowable as those of his people. Thanks. Awesome. Thank you so much, Eric. Um, fabulous. Okay, um, now we'll hear from Michaela Lawson. Um, hi, so I took a bit of a different turn and I went for a fictitious story. Mine is on the lore of sirens and how it is believed women of broken hearts will die and become sirens. Play with a thin line of if that's mental illness or if there's actual sirens. 
as the small town kind of holds this one family as being cursed and doomed to like fall under the siren spell and the main character just not wanting to believe it. But um, well, the piece I'm going to read, she sees her dead mother and she suddenly starts to question everything she tried to fight for so long. Before I start, is anyone uncomfortable? I do, there is one sentence about someone like a suicide. I can stop before the paragraph that I make anyone uncomfortable or is everyone okay with me reading it? Okay. So I'll start and I can clarify later if need be. <laughs> um, just as she called into her mother and began to run towards her, her mother was gone and all that was left was a puddle of lake water. She screamed for her mother and raced after her and bothering, not bothering to lock the door and not caring that she pushed aside James back towards his truck as she ran towards something she didn't even know if it was real. She felt bad for pushing James, but right now nothing else was on her mind but to look for dead mother standing in her bakery. Mom, wait. Her throat was beginning to hurt from all the, her screaming, and her shoes had been kicked off right before she got to the woods leading to the lake. Her sandals did no chance for the woodsy mud anyway. She knew where she was going and was prepared to fight this time. Her feet made a slapping noise as they transitioned from grass to wood. The dock beneath her feet creaked as she slowed down to a stop towards the edge of the water. She felt like her mother was that one night, standing right next, right there next to her, and pained her to be unable to not find her. Misty closed her eyes and took a deep breath as moss and dampness filled her lungs, cutting off her senses and bringing her back to the night where the wind whipped her hair into her eyes and the rain stuck to her skin. No one in the town cared to hear her stories of that night after it first happened, and were even less tolerant when she got older and refused to play into their suspicion. From that night until now, she always claimed no sirens took her mother. The wood beneath her creaked and she could feel the wind moving the dock ever so slightly, just like when she was a child and her mother was teetering over the edge. Missy remembered the way she yelled for her mother to come back, that she loved her, but her mother couldn't see that as enough. Tears rolled down her, tears rolled down her cheeks as a memory consumed her, enveloping her in cold and wetness that seeped into her cold clothes until she was nothing more than a bystander in someone else's life. Missy's mother had driven erratically the night she took on her destiny of being a siren girl. Missy was in the back playing with dolls and ignoring the cries her mother tried to wipe away, along with the rhythm of the windshield wipers. She did not know where she was going exactly and wondered what she would do with her daughter when she got there, but her heart was no longer hers. Realization dawned on Missy's mother as the lady came into view, parking the cart inches away from the crashing waves. Slowly, with the fringed fabric of the seatbelt tearing into her skin, Missy's mother unbuckled herself and pushed against the cool metal of her door handle, forgetting to close it as she walked to the dock. Scared, Missy was easily able to get out of her own seat. Her mother had forgotten to do it properly to begin with. She followed her mother on numb legs, reaching down to catch herself multiple times before reaching the dock. She climbed up the steps, calling for her mother as splinters carved themselves into her small palm. palm. Her mother acted like she didn't hear her daughter, or maybe she truly didn't, but either way, she hardly gave her daughter a sparing glance as with a big grin, she opened her arms and leapt into the water that churned with waves and anger from the rain. Once again, in her present body, Missy tasted blood in her mouth and the sounds of inhuman screeches that shouted in glee after her mother's leap still ringing inside her head like they have since that day. For just, a for just a second, Missy thought that maybe the town was right and she was wrong. Maybe her mother was still alive in those watery depths and not dead from her own hand. Slowly, almost unconsciously, Missy began to walk closer to the edge, one foot hovering, hovering over the water like a tease to spirits that lurked beneath. Um, that may lurk beneath. There was, some, there, was, there was screaming all around her, but she couldn't pin the voice to any direction or any person. It was a collective noise of children and adults, women and men, human and animal, that were conjoined into one loud noise that created deafening energy dragging her, to dragging her towards the water below. Maybe her mother and grandmother weren't crazy. Maybe none of them were. Maybe they were sirens, and this is where they belonged. No more pain. And yeah, that's it. Fabulous. Great, great work. Beautiful story, Michaela. Um, so let's see, I guess to kind of get the conversation rolling, um, I just wanted maybe um, all three of you could talk a little bit about this cultural work of myth that you're all touching on, um, the ways that there's kind of this containment um, function of myth or, you know, the way myth was used um, you know, as opposed, or, you know, as a, maybe as a branch of assimilation in the case that, that Eric is talking about, or um, for Susana, kind of thinking about sexuality and wine and revelry um, as, it, as it is uh, present in Milton's work, or for Michaela, this containment of women's mental health and kind of the idea of 
you know, uh, disruptive women. Um, so yeah, what did you, what do you think about that in terms of um, this role of myth and larger society in your work? I can start if that's all right. Um, but just thinking uh, like, the, cause for me, like the myth aspect has kind of two, two big sides to it in, in the story that I uh, wrote. Cause there's like the myth as something that is a foundational bedrock for uh, different cultures that they have their own personal myths. And in the, in the, this particular um, group, it was really interesting that the, the myths were sort of secret and separate by each family. So you would have your own myth. And if you married into that family or when a child like got to a certain age, they would be invited into that story and kind of learn about it and use it as a family. Um, and then there's the other side where uh, someone can kind of take those secret stories and then create their own version of them and like publish it through you know, an official society system. And then that becomes sort of like the myth instead of a bunch of myths. Um, so yeah, it's a, uh, it's really powerful, I guess. And, and you, you can use it for good or bad. I'm not exactly sure if this is exactly answering the question, but I was really thinking about what inspired the work was partially because at the same time that I was taking this Milton class, I was taking a class on the history of witchcraft um, in the Western hemisphere. And something that kept coming up time and time again was that this, this mythic, it's a, it's a really long legacy, right? So like witchcraft, it wasn't just like Salem witchcraft trials. That idea of a dangerous, magical, sensual woman who, who was designed to entrap a person that that is that comes from Egyptian myth and then Greco-Roman myth, and and what I kept coming back to in the in both of those classes was like, wow, it seems like really people just hate women, um, which I didn't I didn't touch on in my essay because my essay was uh, literary criticism and I was more tracing the legacies of of Comus's parents, but I think that's there's something to be said really in I think all three of our works just how myth can really inform discrimination um, and how myth can really inform uh, the rampant cultural appropriation. I mean like Milton's use of Greco-Roman myth is is just um, one example of it and is obviously not the most insidious, but um, yeah. Um, so part of my like interpretation of myths also came from uh, Professor Miller's witchcraft of the Western Hemisphere class. Um, because in those, if you were like deemed a witch, like everyone in your family was deemed a witch unless they like were able to pin it on you, like solely on you. And so I kind of got that like feeling of like how myths can be like polarizing to a people if they get um, mis- like con like misconfigurized words I can't remember like if people take it and make it their own for their own benefit um so I just saw I took it from like that point of view of like this um polarizing dehumanizing myth that can like once meant something else now can be used to someone's advantage like the town and my story's advantage of uh descaling this one uh, prominent family to make them on like level ground which you read the story you get it but we don't have time um but I also actually took um, myths from the movie Hereditary, um, like the demon myths and like the link between mental illness and what people believe to be like um, possessions and just how that can polarize even just a single family against themselves. Awesome. Um, this is just so fascinating and um, just uh, listening to all of the ways that as storytellers you're entering into these um, either like these myths, either by revealing them and revealing their layeredness and multipleness or otherwise destroying or disrupting the binaries between the myth and the real or what we think of as real. Uh, I loved that about all three works. Um, maybe I'll, I'll open things up to others. Um, I could, I have a million other questions, but I know others do too. I'll ask a question of uh, Susanna. Um, I was struck by what you said in passing about Milton ideologically hating the, uh, his predecessors. And do you mean just simply from a Christian perspective or something more than that? Like what was so ideologically troubling for Milton? 
<laughs> this is probably a whole course worth of material. But. Well, the course was basically what is so ideologically troubling for Milton. And it's good to remember, I think, that Milton was, you know, known for his narcissism. He was certainly a confident man. Um, I forgot the question already. Um, oh, so part of it was, I think, the the Christian sort of ideology that by writing Paradise Lost, his, his life's work uh, finally proved all readers and all literary critics and, and all Christians that Jesus Christ is the one, that the Puritan Christ is the one, and that these stories, this divine philosophy might be charming, um, but it is not as divine or as, or as good, morally good, as the Christian. So I think it's partially a religious thing, but it has so much to do with Milton's ego. Um, I mean, to, to, to say in, in, in the first paragraph of, of your book, I'm gonna write something that is way better um, than anything than anything Homer or Ovid or anybody else wrote. That's a lot, that's a lot to say. Um, so yeah, and my work was really on just his first try, which wasn't as successful as, as, maybe, as maybe Paradise Lost is. Great, thank you, yeah. Mm -hmm. And I just noticed there's a question in the chat actually. Um, is this from your dad, is Gerardo? <laughs> um, great dad. point, Susanna. Uh, but I think this is going to apply to everyone, right? Um, so talking about how mythology informs current issues, such as discrimination and the global pandemic, what can we learn from mythology? So maybe everyone could answer this, not just uh, Susanna. I was gonna um, leave the floor to somebody else, so. <laughs> okay, I can, well, I can think, I mean, I know, especially just as far as, I mean, I, just because there are so many myths that are, are created around indigenous people that are designed to discriminate against them. And earlier in the story, like one of the introductory things is, is uh, George Hunt, he was a, he was instrumental in putting together uh, an anthropological exhibit of the uh, of the people that he was a part of. Well, you know, he was like married into um, at the the World's Fair in Chicago, and so there was this like they created this myth of like here we are uh, doing our our normal everyday life is what they're trying to express or what they were told to express basically, um, except secretly they were uh, intentionally trying to create lives from a hundred years ago. So like what their ancestors were doing. So then the presentation was, here is this great city that has electricity and, and scholarly learning. And, um, and they had a school with Native Americans, act, like actual Native American students learning in a school on the campground fair or the fairgrounds um, alongside these, um, you know, Native examples of what, how these people lived, um, which, you know the layers of who was trying to do what vary, but at the at the highest levels, it was very intentional to say, you know, like white society is better and more advanced. And look at all these curiosities that are fading out that you know are helpless, basically. Um, so yeah, it's just uh, I guess so. To wrap it back to that question, just you have to question your myths uh, very specifically and intentionally, um, and and wonder, you know, who created them and, and why. I have a bit of like a more like a basic add on like it's gonna sound really basic after that one like as intellectual but like just of like myths are just kind of like another piece of history to like look at and compare to everyday life like with COVID-19 like there's myths about all oh, like the great pan other pandemics of the past and like it's kind of just this like almost reassuring thing of like they got through it so can we in an almost like weird way just, I feel like myths are just another part of history and you could always find a myth to compare to anything because life gets repeated as we can see right now.
Um, well, as as far as connecting an issue like mythology to a global pandemic, um, Michaela, you're probably going to have to help me out with this, but I know that there is a long, a long history of um, blaming witches for pandemics. Um, like the Black Plague is a giant example. Like a, you know, it's it's very interesting. I see there's another question about like mythology. Does it have the tendency? Can it be used for good? And I certainly think so. And it's hard for. I mean, it's difficult because religion is is a complex topic but obviously there are like all sorts of different um generational like stories like myth myth is really um a cultural practice and and i'm and i'm kind of running off here my my point was uh, like the connection that i can see most clearly is is the disenfranchisement of of women and then the blaming of of them they're, they're the they're the global scapegoat the historical scapegoat um yeah i guess like because like with myths like with the like they teach us what happened um because like there's like a myth like around witchcraft and it just it, like women would be accused of throwing cats into the ocean to sink ships and Without Miss, we wouldn't know that crazy little tidbit of that past. And we also wouldn't know of like the innocent people, the ones that had letters they sent home to families where they were like, everyone knows I'm innocent, but it's all about politics. And so you hear the myths about their lives, but then because of history to like add on to the myth, you see how some are just stories that get turned into this mythicized idea. Yeah, and I, th I think um, some like an example of that from the stuff that I was looking at where myth is good is, is just in the sort of way it allows communities to bond and have that central um, understanding and belief system, even as this huge other culture is sort of uh, uh, attacking from all sides that you've got that sort of central uh, idea that you can cling to with, with values and things baked in. And I think that's also a very important thing to think about right now um, where myth and storytelling are such vital sources of empowerment and community building and um, you know like historical claiming um, rejuvenation like I think that's also really important to remember um, right now I could just add to that too. Um, I think I know this is specific, maybe to uh, Eric's story that he presented. That women tend to be the preservers of these myths too, the preservers of history. Um, I know Eric, you could probably speak to it a little bit more with like how uh, Hunt took the the stories that he had, and in Michaela's presentation, how it's like the matriarch of the family. Um, if you guys want to talk to that a little bit more. Yeah, yeah. I mean, it, it was just a really tragic dynamic, I guess, that it, it like such a, a precious thing was being passed through uh, the women of the of the culture, um, and then to just you know have that layer of additional sort of stealing and, and disrespect. Um, like as I was kind of reading through stuff and. and looking at how the story was going it's just like no i can't believe like how many how many layers of this sort of thing um, was going on just in this one tiny example that i was looking up for completely different reasons like i i looked into this to understand like the placebo effect and stuff and not and then then there's just this everything i guess just you know has this whole uh, deep background but uh yeah it, it's uh just from what I read of like the ceremonies passing the stories, it was a very private, special like moment from a mother to a daughter, um, like deciding when it's right to share that information and, and to kind of hold it, hold it secretly. With all of you, I, I was just wondering about um, the experience of entering into these stories and 
to what extent you were transformed by telling them. And I'm looking at two on the chat box, the, um, the question, the first question, uh, what gives you hope during these difficult times? Um, if there's some dimension of telling these stories that gave you hope or just in general, like how were you affected or um, otherwise transformed by entering into these stories? I can say that this, the work of trying to find a happy medium um, really did change how I'm going to approach any sort of literary study in the future. Um, I was really encouraged in this work by my professor to just go for it and follow my intuition and think about that little weird thing that keeps coming back in your head and like, okay, if if I'm if I'm thinking about this, I mean, I was obsessed. When I first started writing about this, I couldn't think about anything else. I was like, I'm onto something. I had like, you know, a bunch of equations flying around my head. That was a really empowering experience. So it has definitely changed me. Um, and what gives me hope? I'd say my community gives me hope. Not only the people, the very lovely people that I live with, the very lovely people in my neighborhood, um, but the city of Chicago has been really showing out and it, it is very fortifying. Yeah, I think I had a very similar experience as far as like going down a rabbit hole. It sounds like where you're just like consumed by um, the stuff that you're, you're onto. And um, yeah, it was like probably two weeks. This was like all I was thinking about. And my fiance was out of town at the time. So I just I had like the whole place to myself and no, you know, nothing to do, but just like read a bunch of papers and, and request stuff from the library. And, um, and it, I guess something that uh, had definitely changed through uh, through this process and, and that also I think makes me feel kind of hopeful is just like looking back at, at the times when uh, this original work by Boas was being published. This was like in the 20s and 30s, a lot of the, the bulk of the stuff was coming out and it was written about stuff from around 1900 and a little after. Um, but just kind of, kind of realizing how rock solid that truth was when it came out and like the system in place of like, here's the guy telling you what happened and there's really no way to question it. That just feels so different to today and just the ability to look back at those times and question those things. And uh, it just seems, I hope it, it's harder to establish that sort of foundational, uh, you know, incorrect truth, but uh, you know, I'm not sure, but it, it, yeah, I guess it gives me some sense of hope. Um, I guess I, I'm very similar. Like, I guess it's just a writer thing to get very obsessive about the thing you're into and want to write. I remember I like had, I like found pictures and I found like anything that reminded me of it and like inspired me to keep writing it. Like I went back on Pinterest for the first time in a very long time just to make a character board for this. Cause I'm like, I have this aesthetic in my head. I need it out. Um, and I guess just what gave me hope, like besides like what everyone's already been like saying, like Susanna with like your community and how like that's really inspired you, like just seeing everyone coming together. I would just say it would be like, like my friends and my boyfriend who see me like go crazy with these things and they're like, you're doing great. Like we don't think you're insane. We understand. And that's just very like, that gives me hope that I'm like not losing myself I'm locked up inside. And it's just another added bonus that, you know, they're like my friends and family. <laughs> Yeah, it's really cool when you have like conspiracy writer brain going and then someone looks at you and is like, actually, you're right. And that's, <laughs> that was a really affirming experience. That's wonderful. Well, I mean, I can just say that the energy um, that you're all expressing about your subjects really came through in your writing. Um, and the fact that you made a, a Pinterest board for your character for Missy, really, that really came out. She was very physically present. But for all of you, just um, all those layers and kind of putting things together was very exciting to hear. Um, so unless we have any last words, maybe we should wrap up, right? Because we're, are we near end of time? But anything, any last words that anyone wants to say before we go? Thank you for coming and listening to what we have to say. 
This is really nice. We love getting affirmation. <laughs> the great yes, yeah, thank yeah. you. Mm -hmm. <laughs> really Congrats. great questions too. I thought that was <laughs> round of applause to everybody. Yay. <laughs> <laughs> Be well.